The monument of David Peterson stands defiantly facing towards Mehmet's Wood. This is an account of July the 10th, 1916. Shortly after midnight, the troops for the front line of the attack would began to pass down to White Trench. Then the barrage dropped on Mehmet's Wood. The 16th Royal Welsh Fusiliers were in position in the sunken road about 3am and whiled away the trying hour before the attack with banter and snatches of song. Someone had struck up Aberystwyth as the moment of going over drew near and when the singing finished, Colonel Garden called for silence and he said, Boys, make your peace with God. We are going to take that position and some of us won't come back, but we are going to take it. This is a description of the fighting of Mehmet's Wood by Lieutenant W. R. M. Gwynn of Swansea. When questioned about how he felt in the middle of the terrible bombardment, the young lieutenant, who is only 21 years of age, said, It has a most peculiar effect on you. You can't describe adequately your feelings at hearing the continued deafening roar of the guns and the continuous rain of shells. Two days before the British took Mehmet's, the Germans peppered Mehmet's with weeping shells, and we had to put our goggles on. These shells give off a rather sweet smell, but they make tears come into your eyes, and eventually, if you don't use your goggles, you get so bad that you just can't see. An account of the fighting by the Welsh Regiment. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting and bombing took place throughout the wood. The wood was extraordinarily thick. The Germans had tied the branches of the trees together and it was extremely difficult to force a path through. Machine guns were also hidden in the woodland on either side of the wood. Equipment, ammunition, rolls of barbed wire, tins of food, gas helmets and rifles were lying about everywhere. There were more corpses than men, but there were worse sights than corpses. Limbs and mutilated trunks, here and there, detached head, forming splashes of red against the green leaves, as in an advertisement of a horror of our way of life and death, and of our crucifixion of youth. One tree held in its branches a leg and its torn flesh hanging down over a spray of leaf. Even now, after all these years, this round ring of man-made hell bursts into my vision. Blue sky above, a band of green trees and a ploughed graveyard in which living men moved worm-like in and out of sight. Three men dig in a trench thigh deep in red soil, digging their own graves a bursting shell, their shelter into a tomb, two signallers crouched in a large shell hole, waiting for an order to move, but showing in their patient and tired inactivity the look of dead men ready to rise at the trump of a last judgment. <laughs> Come on, you. Go to your mum. Listen. Who's that? Listen. Go on, Fred. Well, I can hear a buzzard. No. 
Okay. There's still people coming, bringing the, tr the tree that was thingy. Was, it was in this area here, so uh, it's, it's a good chance it's probably got... I mean, it was nearly six years ago. So... Holly's visibly spooked. So this is, you see it here. A lot of people say it's quite eerie in here. Look at that. Not sure. Guys? That's a live one, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's hard to see, but look carefully you can just make out the flag there and this was here when we last came but it's nice that somebody's put their luck there we go right just want to read one of these memorials out in the Mets wood that somebody has kindly put down. It's two, so just making sure it's in shot, and it's remembering a Alfred Priestley. Sorry. So uh, to remember, Private Alfred Priestley, uh, 19871 Signaller, B Company, 16th Battalion, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, killed in action at the Mets wood, Tuesday the 11th of July 1916, aged 20. 20 years old. Remember that face. 20 years old. <clears throat> it says, A man's destination is not his destiny. Every country is home to one man and exile to another, where a man died bravely at one with his destiny. That soil is his. Let his village remember. And we'll pop that back there. For other people to see. There we go. You are remembered, Alfred. You are definitely remembered. Oh, there we go. Is somebody remembered down there as well? Yes. Yeah. There is, isn't there? Terry Wood. Oh, let's have a look. Polly's pointed him out. Terry Wood. There we go. So this gentleman he's probably has some significance with the uh, Let's see. Yeah, Terry yeah. Wood. I've done a little track. Yeah. I wanted to be remembered in uh, my Mets. Mm -hmm. oh, rest in peace Terry. A lot of people say Mamets is an eerie wood. I think anywhere is eerie that's had a lot of devastation or a particularly violent history. I do wish uh, we'd still had the log burner in the van because there's some lovely uh, birch down there. That would have gone down a treat. Quiet, isn't it? Okay. Really quiet, isn't it?
Tierpfahl Ridge was well fortified and the German defenders fought with great determination while the British coordination of infantry and artillery declined after the first day due to the confused nature of the fighting in the mazes of trenches, dugouts and shell craters. The British experimented with new techniques in gas warfare, machine gun bombardment and tank infantry cooperation. The German defenders on the Somme front struggled to withstand the preponderance of men and material fielded by the Anglo-French, despite reorganisation and substantial reinforcements of troops, artillery and aircraft from Verdun. September became the most costly in casualties for the German armies on the Somme. Okay. This is uh, in memory of Private Gilbert Celestine Baker and uh, it's from some of his descendants that uh, they've asked if we could uh, personally remember him on their behalf at uh, Chipfall. And it says, Dear Terry and Lynn, which is my brother and sister-in-law, it says, If you do visit the Chipfall Memorial, I'd be very grateful if you could purchase a and plant a poppy cross, which I understand can be done at the visitor's centre. Here are some details about my great uncle Gilbert. He was 1764 Private Gilbert Celestine Baker of the 6th Battalion, Wiltshire Regiment. He died on the 8th of July 1916 and he was aged 19. Uh, in, during that battle, 354 lost their lives in the Battle of Albert just eight days into the Battle of the Somme. Now behind me is the first panel and just beyond that panel, just around the corner, Private Gilbert's name is inscribed on there, which I've filmed previously. Just uh, reading up on one of the characters who managed to witness the Loch Nagar crater explosion was a uh, Second Lieutenant Cecil Arthur Lewis and he was in 3 Squadron Royal Flying Corps and uh, he was detailed to fly over it but he witnessed the mine being detonated and he describes it as the whole earth heaved and flashed, a tremendous and magnificent column of, uh, rose up into the sky. There was an ear-splitting roar, drowning all of the guns and flinging the machine sideways in the repercussing air like a scrap of paper in a gale. The earth column rose higher and higher to almost 4,000 feet. There it hung and seemed to hang for a moment in the air like a silhouette of some great cypress tree then fell away in a widening cone of dust and debris. A moment came later, the second mine exploded, then the dust cleared. And then once that had cleared, then he looked down and he said it looked like two great big white eyes because obviously it was chalk uh, and it was the two white eyes of the craters. Phenomenal. Obviously this explosion was felt back in the UK. It was rumored to have uh, blasted the windows shut on the Houses of Parliament in London. We were looking at the colour of the soil there and we're wondering if that is possibly the overspill from when the crater detonated. It must have fallen somewhere and it was all chalk and it just seems to be that patch. A 
There's a military cemetery right over there in the distance as well. Yeah, there's the railway dugout cemetery, and which is still in Zillabeek, and just over there, the circular bushes there you can see, that's, that's a crater, and just underneath the tree there you can just see there's a, a bunker. Yeah, I'll just zoom. Uh, you can see that in a bit more detail now. Uh, the town of Ypres is just over there and there's an Ayres just here as well which we've visited before. We haven't stayed on it but there's an Ayres just there and then there's a lovely big lake uh, just over there as well. So this is quite a sizeable cemetery. So we'll have a little look, see what artillery people we can find from this one and then our direction then is over that way and that's when we're going to Bedford House Cemetery which is just over there. Terry's looking through the register at the moment to see if he can find any information on uh, siege batteries that operated in the area. When we look at the information on the gravestones and a, a lot of these all the way across here all saying 5th of January 1918 um, and the regiments that they were with it's a good chance that possibly this uh, cemetery was bombed or, or uh, hit by artillery because across a all of them even the ones at the back as well it says known to be buried in this cemetery so more than likely the soldiers were gathered together buried and then it was probably hit by artillery again so they had a record of who was here but unfortunately the graves have been damaged beyond repair or the bodies have been uh, unfortunately reburied by artillery so they've uh, put the stones into in this shape here to commemorate the soldiers but the soldiers are not necessarily underneath the stone they're just in this land All too familiar story, unfortunately. Nice to see what the people are leaving behind as mementos for anyone passing. And down here, this this looks like a, a shell crater here, look, or perhaps even a mine. It's big enough. Those wires out there, they're absolutely alive with starlings. You can hear them. And there's trees full of them as well. What a chorus! <laughs> 